Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you with us. Nicole Hannah-Jones has written one of the most profoundly moving and deeply thoughtful analytical stories that I have read in a very long time. The article's entitled, Are Democracy's Founding Ideals Were False When They Were Written? Black Americans Have Fought to Make Them True. It was written for the New York Times series on 1619, which in itself is shockingly important and powerful. And I say that because it was good to see the Times publish this series, and in part because they and we should understand hundreds of years of struggle for black freedom, that was for all of our freedoms, is what allowed the Times to step up as it should have, and we all should. What Nicole Hannah-Jones has written is testimony, affirming that while our democracy is at once a unique institution that inspired the world, it was from the beginning built on a lie. It was racked with contradictions, and that the struggle for democracy, freedom, liberty, equality, have been defined by the black struggle for freedom that continues to this day. Nicole Hannah-Jones is a 2017 MacArthur Fellow, has won a Peabody National, Award, National Magazine Award and the George Polk Award. And Hannah Nicole Jones, I mean, I changed your name, I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic a little. Nicole Hannah-Jones, welcome to The Real News. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. And I should mention today, August the 20th, is 400 years to the day that the first Africans were brought enslaved to the English colonies to what is now the United States. Um, yes. Let's just begin with the beginning of how you started the story, which I thought was really interesting. You as a child growing up in Iowa, your dad flying the flag um, that you felt wasn't ours, yours. Um, share that story, because I think that was just a, just a, good way, a good way to start this. Sure. When I was a child, I was uh, pretty deeply ambivalent about my role in this country, whether this was a country that I could claim as my own. I understood that... Black people hadn't been treated as full citizens. I'd seen that even in my own father's lives, in the lives of my family members. And the fact that my father, who was uh, a military veteran, would fly this flag in our front yard every day um, was embarrassing to me. I didn't really understand his patriotism. It seemed to me that um, I didn't understand why a man who came from a people who had been treated so poorly in this country would be so patriotic about that country, it seemed in my child's mind, as my teenage mind, as just a sign of his degradation, that he had kind of accepted our subordination as a people. Um, and the piece, um, which is really about our larger democracy, also kind of culminates in me understanding that um, our experience in this country has made us some of the most uh, American of all Americans, and that our special role as the perfectors of this democracy means that we have as much or more right to claim that flag as anyone. And to show a sh very short story, this is this because what made me think of is a dear friend of mine whose name is Sean Ware, who's a Kiowa, Kiowa man and lives in Wyoming. Um, on the, as we were driving one day and he saw an American flag on the ground in the snow, muddy and dirty. He told me, it made me turn around the car and pick it up. I said, what? Pick it up? What do you mean pick it up? <laughs> After what this country has done to your people, only to pick up the flag? For you? So he was, we went around, picked up the flag, and he said, yeah, because we fought for this flag. Too many of us died under this flag. We're the ones who are making this country whole. And then I That's read right. your article. It made me think of that story immediately. It's the same dynamic. Yes. I mean, this is what we're really trying to do with the 1619 Project is reframe the way that this country has seen Black Americans, but also reframe the way that Black Americans have seen ourselves. We, so long, I mean, going all the way back to when the first group of 20 to 30 landed in Virginia, going back to the Constitution which codifies slavery, uh, going back to the civil rights struggle, going back to Dred Scott when the Supreme Court ruled that Black people, no matter what their, whether they were enslaved or free, could not be citizens of the land of their birth, we have been told that this is not really our country, that we are not full citizens. And what this project is arguing is that Black Americans have played an indelible role in making the ideals of the Constitution true. And that because of that, because of the often bloody uh, fight that Black Americans have waged, not just in serving in every single war that this country has fought abroad, um, but also waging a battle against our own countrymen to be recognized as citizens, that we have as much democracy as this nation has, it is because Black Americans have fought for it. And because of that, 
yes, we should absolutely um, embrace that flag and embrace our patriotism because, as the piece argues, in many ways, Black Americans are as much the founding fathers of this country as uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Even more so than that, the way you describe your, your thesis in this in part is that African Americans are one of the one true cultures that were, came out of this country. Uh, and that, that to me, I mean, the way you frame that is so profound, I think, because it's not how people think. It's either, you know, tell us stories about your relationship to, to the mother continent in Africa, or, you know, and it would, but to get the sense that the reason we're defined who we are is in large part because of the black struggle for freedom in this country. That's right. So when you look at the fact that black Americans are the only group of people in this country who were forced to be here, did not choose to immigrate here, were stolen from their own uh, countries and forced to come to the United States. And then once we got here, we went through this process that was called severing, um, or excuse me, seasoning. Right. And seasoning was an attempt to sever uh, people from Africa, from their religions, from their names, from their cultures, from um, any of the practices that they could have brought with them. And so what I argue is, is in that process, Black Americans in many ways, because we have to become one people out of all of these different ethnic groups, out of all of these different nations, we become one people in America. We have to create a new culture on these lands because unlike European immigrants who could send home for family members, who could send home for their favorite food that they missed or bring cultural artifacts across the uh, ocean, unlike indigenous people who had their sovereign lands here, who still were able to hold on to uh, parts of their culture. Black people were not allowed to do any of that. And we had to sneak and hide whatever uh, parts of our culture we held on to and really create a new people here. So what I'm arguing is that this unique experience of black Americans ended up creating what is uh, the true American culture. And I, by that, I don't mean to disparage native people. I'm not talking about the true culture on the land that was America, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about within the actual country of America that we uh, we were created anew. Well, I, you, you, write, you write about the idea that, that, uh, that American culture is in large black culture, and we also deny that in many ways. Now, I'm gonna come to that, but let me, let me, see, let me take a little, another direction first and then come right back to that. Um, I mean, you know, you write about the re your Reconstruction and the hope and promise of the 1860s and 70s and the, then the imposition of terror on black folks and the struggle for freedom took place in this to fight for this democracy. And I think about that historical moment, and we can talk about that. But as I was reading it, I can't, you also think about, at least I also think about the 60s and 70s of the 20th century and the same struggle to fight for freedom and the same pushback that happened in the 1870s is happening to us again. So, Absolutely. so I, can you, as you wrote a beautiful historical piece, and so put that together for where you think that, what that means for us now in, in 2019, 400 years later. So it's interesting. We learn very little about slavery, and we learn even less about the period of Reconstruction. And that which we're taught about Reconstruction was that Reconstruction was a failure. Right. But that also serves our mythology. If we believe that after the Civil War, when we tried for this brief 12 years to actually create a multiracial democracy and that that failed, then we can be forgiven for the fact that we quickly moved on from that effort and reinstituted a quasi-slavery for black folks for the next 100 years. So I really call um, what we consider the civil rights movement as a second civil rights movement because all of the rights that black Americans were dying for in the 1940s and 50s and 60s were rights that they had earned right after the end of the Civil War. You know, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Well, the 1964 Civil Rights Act is trying to uh, reaffirm those rights. The uh, Voting Rights Act is trying to reaffirm the rights of the 15th Amendment that black people had already won. And the um, 1968 Fair Housing Act is trying to reaffirm the right of the 1866 Civil Rights Act, which barred discrimination in housing. And I think it's just this, uh, perfect kind of summation of how these battles for full citizenship, these battles to actually make this country a true democracy uh, are never really won, that we are constantly having to fight against them. And I think we could look at what follows the election of the first black president and who we then as a country send to the White House as just another example of how we make forward progress, then there is an extreme white backlash, and then we have to re-fight uh, these battles again. Yeah, the, the good thing is black folks have 
consistently proven that they are up to the task, um, that throughout history again and again, Black people have been willing to put their bodies on the line, to risk their lives, and often give their lives to make our founding ideals true. And what I tried to make very clear in the piece is that Black Americans have never only fought just for the rights of Black people. That is, the, the rights struggles of Black Americans have paved the way for all other rights struggles. When you see the laws being passed in the 1960s because of Black resistance, they're not only ending discrimination against Black Americans, but they end up ending discrimination uh, based on gender, based on nationality, based on religion, based on country of origin. And all of that, I mean, from the, when you write about something that very few people know about, which is that in the 1860s and Reconstruction, 1870s, I mean, the Reconstruction, that what we cherish in this country is our public school system yeah. came out of black men work in the legislature, running the government, creating public schools for everybody. I mean, poor white and black folks. And that's something that we never talk about and never acknowledge. Absolutely. So there was really no uh, public school system outside of North Carolina in the South prior to Reconstruction. And what you find is one of the, you know, there's two institutions that formerly enslaved people build as soon as they get emancipation, churches and schools. And schools are so important because of course, black Americans are the only people in the history of our country for whom it was illegal to read and write. And they began to push for common publicly funded schools so that it didn't matter if you had money or not, you would get an education. And when they did this, when you see formerly enslaved people going into the legislator, legislatures and taking the spots of their former enslavers, they don't just push for their own rights. They establish, help establish public schools to serve white, poor white children who were also left out of an education because in the South at that time, the only people who were getting an education were children of the white elite and they were going to private schools. Um, so these schools serve all children and you see for the first time, not only large numbers of black children getting an education in the South, but large numbers of white children. But as you said, this is also a story that's been largely written out of our national memory. And that's why I thought that was a really important thing. I mean, to really explore, to explore that you explored for us in this piece. Um, let me jump to culture before we have to conclude and come back to one last question here. I mean, you, you know, um, when you write about the speech and fashion, uh, and I think this, I think your words were we, were, we were here longer than we were free. Our speech and fashion and the drum of our music echoes Africa, but it's not African. Out of our unique isolation, both our native cultures and, our, and from white America, we forged the nation's most significant original culture. In turn, mainstream society, quote unquote, has coveted our style, our slang, and our song, seeking to appropriate the one truly American culture. I think that's a really important statement. Let's talk a bit about the the, the, the profound nature of, of African-American culture, how it, what, it's, what it's done for this entire nation, and, and why we're so blind to it as well. So this also comes from um, this idea uh, of American universalism. And uh, it began really at our founding that you could come here and if you were white, no matter where you came from, you would lose the old ways and kind of just blend into this bland Americanism. But black Americans were excluded from that because black Americans were considered uh, unassimilable. Because of that, we held on and created certain aspects of culture. So I write in the piece, when you hear American, quintessential American music, it's the black voice that you hear. Um, when you think about American fashion, it's the style of black Americans that we develop out of slavery when we are trying to exert our individuality um, in, in opposition to a system that tried to erase all of our individuality, that these are the, the quintessential American culture and that white Americans, because of this desire to have this universalism, are really grasping for the culture. And so you often see it being appropriated, but black people being uh, demeaned for many of these same practices. Yeah, I wonder, you know, when you write, uh, very quickly, you write about the um, I mean, end of Reconstruction, with Rudy B. Hayes taking over the presidency and the beginning of terror against the black world throughout the South, especially, but across the country. Um, a lot of people would ask the question, are we here again? Do we, have, do we have to really look at our history as you did it for us in the article and think about what does that say about this moment and what we have to guard against and what we have to understand about where we cannot let ourselves go? Absolutely. That's, that's why I say... You know, anti-black racism, xenophobia is in the very DNA of our country. We have to constantly fight against what is almost natural to us. 
And so we have to guard against that. And we guard against that in one way by understanding our history and understanding that we're, um, if, we, if we are not careful, we can quickly spiral back to where things, we would never go back to where things were. But we can certainly right. spiral back um, <laughs> to where we don't want to be as Americans. And I think one of the, the reasons that this project has garnered so much interest is we are seeing a rise in white nationalism. We are seeing a period, you know, at least for a while, I, I would never think that white nationalism and white racism went away, but you couldn't publicly uh, talk about it. It wasn't something you could publicly express. And I think the fact that we're seeing this coming back out into the open, we're seeing it be more explicit again. We're seeing this type of uh, racist, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-Black rhetoric uh, being propagated. People want understanding. They want to see how did we get here again? And I think this project um, really provides that basis of knowledge that people are looking for. Well, Nicole Hannah-Jones, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy. And I want to say that this last weekend, I spent with three of my oldest friends. Um, and we talked a great deal about this series. And I, I would encourage everyone to really wrestle with the series that came out in the Times. It's really an amazing piece of work that was done here. I want to thank you all for doing it. And thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Hey y'all, my name is Tharna Noor and I'm a climate crisis reporter here at The Real News Network. This is a crucial moment for humanity and for the planet. So if you like what we do, please, please support us by subscribing at the link below. Thank you.